Welcome to the Ray Hanania Radio Show brought to you by the U.S. Arab Radio Network and sponsored by Arab News, the leading English language newspaper in the Middle East at ArabNews.com. It's Thursday, October 24th, 2024, and this is Season 4, Episode 11. This week here in the Ray Hanania Radio Show, we discuss the upcoming elections with local state candidates in the Arab American community. What are their issues and challenges, and how is the conflict in the Middle East impacting their elections? A YouGov poll co-sponsored by Arab News recently shows that for most Arab and Muslims in America, the conflict in Gaza and Lebanon is a major factor on how they will vote. The Arab community appears split between the Democrats and the Republicans, Trump and Harris, although a large majority will support a third-party candidate like Dr. Jill Stein. My first guest to discuss all this today is Democrat Suzanne Akras, who is running for the Illinois House 82nd District, which became vacant in December 2013. 23, and a Republican was appointed to fill that vacancy. Akras is a passionate advocate committed to driving positive change and upholding our shared values. She's dedicated to ensuring women's access to reproductive health care, securing and expanding mental health resources, advocating for community safety initiatives, and reducing gun violence. We will also speak with Dr. Ahmed Ghanem, a Democrat and former candidate in Oakland County, Michigan, who ran for Congress in the 11th District. Dr. Ganim was invited by Kamala Harris and her campaign campaign to a meeting in Michigan um, to build support among Arab American community members and voters. Ganim was allowed into the meeting, but after passing through security and then sitting down, waiting for others for the meeting, meeting to start, He was asked by security to come to the door, and then he was escorted out of the room without any explanation. The Harris campaign later apologized for it, but it created an embarrassing moment that hasn't helped Harris's efforts to restore support among Arab Americans in Michigan, a swing state where candidate Harris is having lots of problems. The Ray Hanania Show is broadcast live every Thursday at 5 p.m. at WNZK AM 690 Radio and rebroadcast on Monday at 5 p.m. It is also available online at arabnews.com slash radio show in podcast audio format, but you could also watch it on Facebook at facebook.com slash arabnews. Get more information on myself, Ray Hanania, at arabnews.com or at my personal web page at Hanania. Dot com. We'll be right back with our guests right after these messages. ArabNews.com, bringing you breaking news from across the Middle East and the latest on Arabs in America. Get inside the latest headlines with expert analysis and insights at ArabNews.com. Join over 5 million Facebook fans and over 10 million monthly readers. ArabNews.com, news that matters to you. Hey, Michigan, let's think beyond the sink and learn where the water your family drinks every day comes from. Private wells and public water supplies allow homes across Michigan to draw water from different sources, like lakes, rivers, and groundwater. Tap into the facts about your home's water source and learn about your home's water quality to protect your family's health. Visit michigan.gov slash care for MI drinking water. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Life for Relief and Development has now been rated as one of the best charities for humanitarian aid. Life's humanitarian projects span the globe, and Life is celebrating its 30th anniversary of providing essential life-saving aid to people and communities in 36 countries, regardless of race, color, religion, or cultural background. Where there is life, there is hope. And when disaster occurs here or around the world, including being one of the first responders to the Turkey-Syria earthquake crisis, Life for Relief and Development rushes in to provide food, medical aid, and shelter to those in need. We are looking to help the earthquake victims, and we take 0% overhead on emergency donations. So please help improve these efforts. Learn more about our involvement to help the helpless and bring hope where it's needed most. And make your tax-deductible donation to Life for Relief and Development now at lifeusa.org or call 248-424-7493. That's 248-424-7493. With more than 30,000 successful in vitro fertilizations, IVF Michigan is now ranked as one of America's best fertility clinics according to Newsweek magazine. IVF Michigan fertility centers are the recognized leaders in high quality fertility care. 
With locations in Bloomfield Hills and nine other cities in Michigan and Ohio, IVF has experts in all aspects of the field. A founding member, American Board Certified Dr. Nicholas Shama, is one of the leading reproductive endocrinologists in Michigan and Ohio. He has performed over 20,000 successful IVF cases and it's helped thousands of couples fulfill their dreams of parenthood. When it's time to get personalized care from Dr. Nicholas Shama at one of America's best fertility clinics, call IVF Michigan Fertility Centers in Michigan and Ohio toll free at 855-952-9600. 855-952-9600. Every Thursday in Michigan at 5 p.m., award-winning columnist and journalist Ray Hanania hosts the Ray Hanania Radio Show, presented by the U.S. Arab Radio Network on WNZK AM 690 Radio and brought to you by Arab News Newspaper. This season's focus is on the U.S. presidential elections. Will it be Donald Trump, Kamala Harris, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., or Dr. Jill Stein? Veteran political analysts and elected officials will join as guests. Join us every Thursday at 5 p.m. on WNZK AM 690 Radio for the Ray Hanania Radio Show, presented by the U.S. Arab Radio Network, a special on the presidential elections. Shows are rebroadcast each Monday at 5 p.m. Get to know more about the show at ArabNews.com. And now I want to welcome my first guest today, Democrat Suzanne Akras, who is running for the Illinois House 82nd District, which became vacant in Illinois in December 2023. And a Republican was appointed that, at that time to fill the vacancy. So in essence, it's basically an open seat. Akras is a passionate advocate committed to driving positive change and upholding our shared values. She is dedicated to ensuring women's access to reproductive health care, securing and expanding mental health resources, advocating for community safety initiatives, and reducing gun violence. And she has endorsements from across the board in this state. Um, and it looks like she has a great shot. Suzanne Akras, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Oh, thank you, Ray, for inviting me. I appreciate the invitation and uh, appreciate the time to talk about my race. Now, everybody, your website for everybody is at SuzanneForIL.com, and that's S-U-Z-A-N-N-E for mm-hmm. IL.com, just so they get it right. Um, and they can obviously go there. But tell us a little bit, first of all, about yourself. What Have you run for office before? And if not, why did you decide to run for office this time? What were the reasons? So uh, I have not run for office before, but I have worked on different campaigns, um, starting with the, you know, from the time of Obama when he first ran. I've always held fundraisers. I've I've worked. I've canvassed. I knocked on doors, uh, made phone calls for people to, you know, did, did phone banking um, early on in the 2000s. And, um, and and it's something that sparked. It was always an interest of mine. Um, and I lead a nonprofit. I start. I founded my own nonprofit in 2015 called the Syrian Community Network, where I help resettled uh, uh, refugees from uh, who come in through the State Department's uh, program, and not only Syrians but Afghans and and and, and anyone who needs our services, basically. And um, um, and uh, you know when you do advocacy and when you do no, uh, nonprofit work, you're always advocating for your clients. You're always advocating for issues, policies that affect your clients, um, you know, at the federal level, at the state level, at the city level. And, you know, I, I felt like I was in this realm all the time. And I, you know, I when I heard about this vacancy, I decided, you know, I, I wanted to take a shot, but I still was hesitant. And at that time, um, uh, in 2022, after I had lost my father, Allah he, he passed away. And um, I felt really lost and I wanted a new direction. Um, I just I felt such a void. But then my grandson was born and I think holding him in my arms and, and feeling, you know, like a new life uh, was, you know, put in, inside of me. I don't know how to explain the feeling, but uh, the sense of urgency also to serve in a different way. Like I, I want to do something to make his life better. Um, whether it's about environment, whether it's a community safety and, and not just, you know, about my grandson, but everybody's children, of course, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, the community, uh, you know, all of us in Illinois, right. um, gun safety, you know, all these things that, you know, we, we think about, we worry about, you know, God forbid there, there would be a shooting at someone's school or something like this. So, so I started to think about these things and it, it became a, a sense of urgency inside of me. 
Um, and and then you know again I I kept hearing about the vacancy and and people saying about the seat and why don't you run and 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 so then I decided you know I'm I'm going to f- go for it I made my prayers I I asked for support from my family I talked to people and I felt a lot of enthusiasm and I I went for it. And Arab and Muslims are not uh, we don't see many Arab and Muslims run for office we we are seeing more and more. What do you say to the average American when they say, oh, you're Arab or, oh, you're Muslim? You know, uh, w- what should they really know about? Uh, we're American, right? Uh, just like everybody else. We're loyal and dedicated to this country. What do you say? It, when, does that question come up? Um, and what do you say when it does? Yeah, people ask me, well, how many years have you been here? Like people think like as if I'm a newcomer or something. I say, no, I've been here for 42 years. Um, everyone immigrated here from somewhere. Uh, that's something right. everybody has an immigrant story in their family. So whether it's uh, this generation, uh, uh, your grandparents' generation, or your great-grandparents, or they came on the Mayflower, they were all immigrants. And um, looking for a better life, looking for safety and security, um, or, or, or escaping religious persecution, especially early on in, you know, from the time of the Mayflower. And, um, uh, you know, I talk about my my father, how he first came in the 1960s to study engineering. And then he met my mother. My mother is white. My mother, um, uh, she's not Syrian. My dad is Syrian. And um, and then they went back to Syria and my dad worked a little bit. And then we came back here in 1982 and I was 10 years old. And I will say I was 10 years old when I arrived to the United States. Um, and um, my father uh, is U.S. educated. He, you know, worked really hard to uh, to put us through school. My sisters and I made sure that we went to college. You know, the immigrants work hard. My father started his own uh, engineering company. And um, and then my mother uh, managed all aspects of his work. And I say, this is the immigrant story. You go to a lot of these mom and pop shops, whether it's a Chinese restaurant, whether it's a dry cleaning business, whether it's, a, you know, any any restaurant or any place that you see, you see, I will see the husband and wife and sometimes the kids also <laughs> working um, in those in those places. And that's how you build up you know, the, those institutions and those places and, and make a, a thriving business because everyone in the family, and that's how immigrants get by. Um, and so I always share these stories about like coming here, the struggle, um, how people help me, the teachers that help me, my volunteer jobs that I start early on that what made me, that gave me that sense of belonging, volunteering in the community. And so I share these stories over and over with people and, you know, hoping that they realize that, yes, they too, if it wasn't them, it was their parents or their grandparents that had went through similar struggles. Yeah, I mean, listen, Syrian Americans have been part of the early immigration of the United States since the 1800s. Yeah. And they've served in every war defending the United States, just like everybody else in World War II. There were over fifteen to 20,000 Arab Americans. The majority were Syrian Americans who mm-hmm. identified as Syrian Americans. So there's a long history of patriotism in our community. And I know that, you know, because of the Middle East conflict, we kind of get pushed into our own little corner. Yeah. Um, and, 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 but before I talk about that, I wanted to ask you, tell us about what are some of the priority issues that you have when, when you get to the legislature, what are the things that you want to do? So my top three issues are ensuring that we protect women's access to health, uh, whether it's reproductive rights, whether it's, um, you know, making sure that they have good maternal health, uh, they have the support they need, um, you know, in, in every aspect that they need. Um, uh, this is an important issue for me as a mother, as a grandmother, as, you know, um, you know, for people to realize that women's health is uh, should be a priority uh, in maternal health. Uh, so that's one of them, ma- my major issue. Um, number two is community safety and gun sense laws. Um, I I uh, I am a gun sense candidate through the Moms Demand Action because none no one is above um, ex- you know God forbid experiencing gun violence either at school or at a shopping mall or something like this. And we see this happening over and over and over in the last twenty years. And we need to have a smart regulation, um, um, meaning that if you own a gun, that's great. You know, I have friends who own guns, but you make sure, you know, there should be safety sh- storage. There should be a way to um, uh, make sure that, you know, if you have kids at home, that this is, prote- you know, that you protect your arm, <laughs> your your uh, your gun away from the children, because the leading cause of children in the United States is by gun violence, because of accidental shootings by, um, you know, a, a child who sh- shoots at his parent or his sibling or whatever or shoots at himself because they don't know 
uh, what this can, the harm that can happen. So this is very important that we protect our kids uh, from this, from this harm. Um, and then, of course, number th my th third priority is mental health um, and um, bringing mental health resources to the district. No one is immune to having mental health issues, whether it's depression, whether it's, um, you know, seasonal depression, whether it could be grief, losing a parent, losing a sibling, losing a, a partner or spouse that, you know, you, you people go through grief in different ways. Um, the opioid crisis, a crime, all of these things are related to mental health uh, issues and, and so the, and, and lack of resources. Um, and I work in nonprofit and I see the, the urgency in this because it's so hard to find referrals uh, for people who will take, um, you know, uh, different types of insurance. Not everyone will take a, an insurance doesn't doesn't, you know, like if it's not a good, good insurance policy or if it's Medicaid or something, not every doctor or provider will take uh, this type of insurance. And so end up people who are very vulnerable uh, end up not having the support that they need. And so, and that could lead to other issues. And so making sure that people have access to mental health is really important. And I know that, you know, I mean, I don't think in our community, we really understand the different levels of government. Mm -hmm. You're running for an office for state legislature. You don't mm -hmm. deal with foreign policy at the state legislative level. There may be a few things that you yeah. could address that may touch on foreign policy, but that's not your issue. You can't do anything. Now, as an elected official, you could speak out and say, I support this. Um, you're opposed to the violence in Gaza and Lebanon, but technically you can't do anything about that. But you can do things for the Arab community as a legislator in Illinois, like helping us to improve our culture, to get funding for our mosques and our churches, correct? I mean, yes. there are a lot of things you could do as a legislature for our community here. Of course, the representation matters. That's the first thing that we should always remember. And, um, you know, having a voice in uh, within the state also is very important, um, making ensuring that we have a MENA category. I know there was legislation that was passed um, and uh, to in, in Illinois to ensure that we have a MENA category. Um, and um, and so that's that's very important in ensuring that that continues to happen and making sure that our community is represented so that we can get the grants and the funding, whether it's scholarships, whether it's, you know, for nonprofits, different not Arabic speaking nonprofits, ensuring that that funding goes to our community also. Um, right. And so that really really important people don't realize that uh, state legislators can bring funding to different communities um, in need as uh, nonprofits things like this um, and so that's that's one thing uh, you can also work around uh, the issue of um, anti-arab uh, sentiment anti-islamophobia right. um, speech um, those types of things you can create some certain types of legislation that will protect our community from these types of things because as we see we saw with um, uh, last year uh, around this time last year the little boy um, you know, uh, it was so sad. I just like I, right. I cannot wrap my head uh, around how this happened. As that someone would stab him so many times and stab his mother, a little boy, you know, and so the the, the inflammatory language that is used sometimes around about our community it really affects us, and it ha affects our mental health, affects the way we operate during the day, and this is really important that we we need to address. And they acted on an extreme example like that, where this poor little kid was murdered uh, by the uh, landlord, stabbed. Mo I don't know how many times. It's just unbelievable, but. Uh, part of the problem with the state is sometimes that they don't take Islamophobia and anti-Arab racism as seriously as they should, correct? They're everyday incidents where we have no place to go to yeah. complain. Nobody hears about it. The media doesn't cover it. So having you in the legislature, you shine a light on not just the big tragedies, but the mm -hmm. everyday things where you don't get hired because somebody looks at you because you wear a hijab or because your skin is dark or you have a little bit of a Middle East accent. Exactly. And this is a, what, what a state legislator can bring and highlight and put a face to this issue because this uh, too, for far too often and far too long that we have not had a face and a voice uh, uh, pushing on this uh, on this topic. And I, I really believe that people who are in power, who hold a position are responsible sometimes uh, uh, about the you know things that they say they should be 
um, you know, like especially when it brings harm to a community, they should be responsible for that because it, it, it's not right that we we say these types of things and then just and like you said, it's brushed under the rug. Right. Uh, and then part of it also is that we have to change the way we operate as uh, as a community. Is that we need to bring these stories. We uh, too often we suppress what what happens to us. Like uh, you know, sometimes like somebody will say something a microaggression uh, towards me, and then I just like hold it in where I don't speak about it and I don't like, and we internalize this, oh, there must be something wrong with us. There must be, you know, like that we're always like feeling this way. And and, and I see this a lot with people. So I say, look, well, why don't you speak up? Why don't you say, you know, ask, you know, tell your boss this or say, no, no, I can't, like, I'm afraid. And so there's, so it goes both ways. Yes. Uh, but and, and and since October 7th, we've seen where people are too afraid to speak out because there have been um, uh, shifts in, in um, the way HR and, and management and things where they're actually people are being punished if they speak out. And there's no place to go. So if yeah. I don't have if I feel that there's no place to go, I'm going to you know, internalize it and not speak out. So yeah. I know we have Abdul Nasser Rashid is in the legislature, you going to the legislature. That would give us, and I think we have uh, uh, one yeah. other person, but um, yeah, so uh, Said Nabila, I, I, I believe Nabila Sayed. Yeah, Nabila Sayed. Yes, Nabila Sayed, excuse me. Um, I think that that gives us a presence and an awareness for others to understand what are the issues impacting our community. That's why I think it's so important to have an Arab American and a Muslim in the legislature. But, you know, our community, they're focused on the Middle East. Sometimes they turn away from, you know, what's happening here. How does that impact you, um, you know, as a candidate when you're trying to uh, get votes together? How do you address that a dichotomy of focus where they focus on the Middle East and yeah. they don't focus enough on the local issues that become the base to change policy in the Middle East. And this is, yeah, I've been struggling with this um, since my campaign started, you know, um, you know, um, I, I truly believe that you, if you want to change something on top, you need to start in the bottom. Um, you need to grow the grassroots uh, and having a strong grassroots base uh, will affect policy down the line. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take time. Um, and, and just being present in different spaces at the local level, I think is really important. And then having those one-on-one -on -one conversations that I've been having with different people, that people see your point of view when you tell them in a way um, that kind of like humanizes people. Um, and so, you know, over and over, I keep saying, well, you know, people have the right also to self-determination and they have the right to their own home state and this is their land and this is blah, blah, blah. You know, and, you know, we have these discussions and, and then people... They will ask me, they start to ask me, well, how are your friends doing? And how is this? So I'm, I'm watching the news now. I follow the news. Thank you. Some people have told me, thank you for telling us all these things, because now I follow the news more you know, intently when the New York Times writes, writes something about Gaza or this and that. So it's just small, having small conversations that I think really helps. Um, and, and, and at times, you know, part of it is that we don't have the civic, uh, especially those of us who immigrated here from, you know, uh, from Syria or from Palestine or from Egypt or wherever, we don't have the civic education also um uh, we always vote voted for the president and it was always 99 percent 99.9 percent yes yeah. for the president you know um and so we don't realize that the people on the bottom also are just as important but in a dictatorship of course it's just the president or the you know at and the, the people on the bottom are just really puppets to that but but really here at the local level, you can agitate, you can do things, you can bring up legislation, you have more power than we think. And we don't really, um, we have not really um, uh, channeled that energy in the local level and to care about local issues because we should care about our, our neighbors, we should care about what's happening here, we should care about our taxes, the curriculum, the education. And I feel sometimes these are missed opportunities um, uh, that we don't advocate for things that are good for all Illinoisans. You know, or, you know, all, you know, um, we, we, we have common values with many faith groups, with many cultures, and we can really create change at the local level. And those relationships grow into something else and grow and grow and grow, you know, and, and that's how you create that movement. But we need to start focusing on local level so that we can affect the, the, the international. And right now, I, I feel like the U.S. policy in the Middle East is who cares? Like this is I, unfortunate. I'm so sad. It's it breaks my heart because we saw this in action in Syria. We we're seeing this now. In you mean Iraq. that it's drifting? That nobody's yeah. caring about what what it's yeah. doing? 
Yeah, yeah they, it's just words. It's just we need a ceasefire. We need this. We, and it's just like, okay. Like, well, <laughs> I, I try to explain when I talk to people, I explain to them, I said, listen, I want my neighbor to support the good things that I support. Yeah. If I beat my neighbor up over something so foreign that he doesn't understand, he becomes my enemy. But yeah. if I talk to him about cr local crime, local schools, making sure his kids are safe and my kids are safe and that we all get the same benefits, that we get better health care and we get the same rights, you know, all that, that neighbor is going to identify with me. And once he identifies or she identifies with me, I can then say, by the way, this extends to the Middle East mm -hmm. to understand that it's an unfairness in the Middle East. That's the way to get people to change Middle East policy, as you point out, by starting from the ground level and working our way up. Yes, yeah, and um, and you know, I know some people in the community don't like some of my endorsements, um, but well, I think I, there I, was one endorsement you have. Yeah. When I'm looking at you, got a lot of great endorsements. endorsements. Yeah, I have many endorsements. The Sierra but, Club, the uh, yeah. the United uh, Chicago Federation of Labor. Um, you have the Indo-Americans, you have the Citizen Action, AMVOTE, um, yeah. the Arab American Democratic Club, um, local operating engineers, and the one uh, Planned Parenthood has endorsed you, Personal PAC. I'm just looking at all these things. Bill Foster, the congressman, Jan Schakowsky, very mm -hmm. pro-Arab, uh, Jewish-American congresswoman from the north uh, sub uh, side of Chicago and suburbs, Dick Durbin, U.S. Senator, another really mainstream, yeah. sensitive person, Chewy Garcia. And then for some reason, people are mad because Sean Caston endorsed you. And I'm thinking, scratching my head, going, why does that matter? Because they have a beef with Sean Caston. They want to take it out on you. I don't understand that. So Sean Caston is holds 70% of my district. Right. Uh, and um, in, in District 82. Uh, so in addition to, uh, there's a small percentage of Chuy Garcia that, that oversees the district and Bill Foster. Um, and so these are people that I will be, need to work with right. um, in order to get funding, federal funding uh, for programs such as mental health, such as gun safety, such as community uh, uh, improvements, uh, roads, infrastructure, those types of things. So I need to work in local politics. It means you have to work with people from this side and this side and, 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 and working with everyone so that you can get things done. The idea and, is to get things done and to serve the community. And working with them, you can get them to understand issues better if yeah. they may not understand yeah. it. I think everybody seems to understand the issues right. Sean may not completely understand the issues right, but with you in office, you can get him to change his mind. You could open doors for the community um, to change his mind. Opportunity. For dialogue, you can continue to create opportunities for dialogue to um, work with him and yes. to, um, you know, this is the way to, you know, that you can get things done. You don't have to agree on everything, but you, if you agree on a lot of things, especially here at the local level, we agree on, like he has... I'm in, you know, in, in several of some of the same people who endorse me endorse him as well. Uh, the education union, the Sierra Club, all those right. things. That, unions you know so we have uh, our platform at the local level is very similar and, and, and aligns and so as long as that align alignment and then we can work on the other things that we don't agree about and then you know work uh, on this and and hopefully we can come to you know with time and and good relationship building we will you know see results I'm to, hoping. <laughs> to support something we can't be against everybody when we yeah. have a disagreement over something um i i wanted to also point out that uh uh, YouGov, which is a polling uh, company, co-sponsored a survey with the Arab News, where this radio show is sponsored and where I write uh, for at ArabNews.com. They did a survey of Arabs in, uh, in America, and uh, according to that survey, they said, you know, the conflict in Gaza and Lebanon is a major factor when it comes to the national election. And it also says that... Uh, the Arab community without a third party are kind of split between Republicans and Democrats because the Arabs are traditionally conservative, I think, but the majority currently are leaning toward Jill Stein. I know that, yeah. I guess the Sean Kasson thing is one doorway into this, but um, how does that national election impact your election in terms of, you have these local issues that, that you want to support. Are people able to see those or is this national issue at the national presidential election level distorting and fogging it so they can only see 
the foreign policy challenges and not see the things that need to be done locally. How does it impact yeah. you as a candidate? Yeah, and you know, you worry that people will not go out to vote because they think, well, I don't like either one, and 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 I'm tired of voting for the lesser of two, two evils. Right. Um, that that's something that you know will affect all of us. And there are some people who will go out and vote for Jill Stein, um, which at least they're going out to vote, and th that's a good thing, you know. Um, uh, but I, you know, I, I keep telling people, engaging with people, like you need to know like who is, adjusts your taxes, who is the person who sets the curriculum at your school. Uh, the public library, the the people who sit on these boards, the people who sit on, you know, the the from the assessor's office to the uh, township office, all of these people are the ones who, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, give you your bill, your tax bill, basically, uh, for your house, for your property, and for you know, these are people who work um, uh, with you uh, to improve your streets, uh, your lighting, and uh, uh, you know, and your street who funds the police uh, uh, station, who funds the libraries, who funds all these, um, the water reclamation. Uh, we should care about these issues because these are issues that impact us every day and impact our neighbors. And and just because a lot of our community members, I think part of it is that we, we are an affluent, you know, not everyone, of course, right. but there's a majority that are affluent where a lot of us are physicians, we're in healthcare, where, you know, we have, you know, when I'm, when I'm canvassing, a lot of the, the huge houses I knock on are Arab houses, <laughs> you know, uh, in Lamont and Burridge and, in, you know, and Hinsdale and everywhere, you know, I've been knocking on, you know, the giant houses of, of Arab, Arab Americans. And sometimes I think that um, uh, that privilege uh, gives us a little bit of sometimes we don't think about those other issues at the local level because we're really focused. And and this issue of uh, Gaza and, and right now it's it's terrible. It's it's absolutely horrendous. My husband went there for three weeks. Um, it was there were times I lost contact with him. I had no idea where he was. Um, um, and it was really a really difficult three weeks for our whole family. And and it was difficult on him. And and um and I think it's just I mean, it, and the situation has gone from terrible to worse to catastrophe to to um, you know all out. I think it's hell on earth right now. What the way the way people are living, and I, I feel so so sad and and so mad at the administration for not dealing with it and not putting a stop, not leveraging all of our diplomatic might or all of our might to end the you know end this catastrophe right now on the people of Gaza. And this is so unfair for them, you know. Um, but I, I you know my heart really bleeds, and I live this every day with my husband because he's on phone calls he's talking to the doctors all the time and he's you know and you internalize these things and you carry them because it's you feel it's an amana you know it's a trust that you have that you want to serve people and you want to help them but at the same time let let's get our our community voting at for local issues and then i i guarantee you that in in a few years the tide will shift because the tide is shifting on on the, the narrative of Palestine, and and with the local working in the local level, the tide will shift even more. The thinking, the way people, are, the the sympathy, the the outpouring of support has come more and more, and will come more if we focus on local issues and we care about our neighbors and we work with them and and support their initiatives and they support ours uh, as well, and not live in this bubble uh, of our own, but really be in the in on the streets with people sharing their pain. Um, you know, one of my neighbors uh, was telling me about, you know, her um, her daughter who, you know, was take, started taking drugs in, in college and now she has an addiction. And like these are things that real people care about, you know, and, and it's and it could happen to anyone, any of our kids, any of anyone. And we should really care about our neighbors and, and these issues and, and work towards improving life here in America. America is not perfect, but it can be if we all of us can roll up our sleeves and work in, in a civic space and, and volunteering in different causes. Uh, I, I believe that we can improve the way Arab Americans Arab Americans are seen within the, the you know the 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 big picture of what America is, and that we're giving back to this the, to the country uh, the, of our of our choice. We're we're here. Um, uh, we are fully American, and we need to work towards this. But we can also be proud of our Arab culture and our roots, and and bring that in every day, similar to Irish Americans and Polish Americans, and and what they do, and 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 really be part of the fabric of the, this country. And, and for our listeners, they should know that your husband is Zahar Sahlul, who uh, is founded Med Global, who is one of the leaders in providing medical care to refugees and displaced people in war zones and conflict zones in the Middle East and in parts of Europe and the Ukraine and in parts of South America. So he's done a lot. And I think you make a really important point. In Illinois, we don't get the funding 
as an Arab and Muslim community because we don't have the base to get it. And without mm -hmm. that funding, our voices about foreign policy are weakened. So if we can get mm -hmm. that funding, if we get the respect from the state about who we are, we can have a stronger impact on other issues like foreign policy. So I think your principle, you have to start from the bottom and work your way up in politics, is 100% correct. That is the and, way and to do it. And being sincere in our service, you know, it's you know, yes, we do want the um, uh, our our community to get the funding and the the services and those types of things. But really, being sincere and intentional about serving everyone, um, right. I, I, you know, throughout my, you know, in the last twenty years, I've volunteered and and done things in the community. Whether it's helping to start a, a food pantry, whether it's starting my own nonprofit, working in different spaces, leading galas, doing fundraising for different things. Uh, for different causes, I really like those causes. Really move me to do up to put my whole heart and self and soul into this. And and, and you know, you know, I I'm, alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm proud to say that you know the things I've done, I I I make an impact because I, I my intention is pure. And I you know reset my intention over and over every day when I go out to canvas. I've knocked on eleven thousand doors so far, and my intention wow. is to serve. The greater community, everyone in the district 82, and to serve our community and to serve the needs of the vulnerable and the needy uh, in, within the district and those who need other services. You know, but you know, as as a Muslim, I we always feel that we should um, always serve the the poor and the needy. This is you know, it's ingrained in our in our faith. It's ingrained in our um, in everything that we do, and then serve everyone's needs um, and and you know have that sincerity that that ikhlas, the sincerity in our hearts to do things uh, 100% and 110%. As our parents always used to say, if we got an A+, plus, why didn't you get an A++? Plus plus? And that's, we always strive, as Arab Americans, we always strive to get the A++. Plus plus plus. <laughs> we have to do that. All right, I want to yeah. thank my guest, Suzanne Akras. She is a, a candidate for the Illinois House District 82nd seat, uh, which became vacant and was filled by an appointment in December 2023. Suzanne is a Democrat here in Illinois, running in the November 5th uh, uh, election that's coming up in a few weeks. And her website is Suzanne for Il for IL, Suzanne for IL com. And Suzanne has two ends. Uh, Ms. Akras, thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to seeing what happens. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I appreciate the time. We're going to take a quick break and we'll come back with more here at the Ray Hanania Radio Show. We'll be right back right after these messages. ArabNews.com, bringing you breaking news from across the Middle East and the latest on Arabs in America. Get inside the latest headlines with expert analysis and insights at ArabNews.com. Join over 5 million Facebook fans and over 10 million monthly readers. ArabNews.com, news that matters to you. As the weather gets colder, it's a good idea to layer up with scarves, hats, and mittens. Another layer of protection this season is to get your flu and COVID-19 vaccines. You can get both vaccines at the same time. Talk to your health care provider or learn more at michigan.gov slash COVID flu RSV and layer up for some added peace of mind. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. At Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic in Dearborn, we provide effective physical therapy sessions in order to limit pain and discomfort. Top Rehab provides physical therapy care for any diagnosis prescribed by a physician, and we regularly see and treat conditions such as stroke, TMJ, fibromyalgia, sciatica, joint pain, and more. We use a variety of pain management methods, including modalities, soft tissue mobilization, and therapeutic exercise. If you're in need of physical rehabilitation or physical physical therapy, get the highest quality health care at Top Rehab. Most insurance is accepted and we're open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday 8 to 6, Tuesday and Thursday 8 to 5, and Saturday 10 till 2. Call for an appointment today at 313-846-0555. That's 313-846-0555. Choose Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic on Michigan Avenue in Dearborn. Life's too short to be in pain. Ziad brand quality products from our family to yours Ziad brothers importing offers the finest quality products including brands like sultan kraft nestle hook 
Rico Picon, Donna, and many more. Ask your retailer to carry these fine products because you deserve the very best. For more information, visit our website at www.ziad.com. That's www.ziad.com. Ziad, quality products from our family to yours. Every Thursday in Michigan at 5 p.m., award-winning columnist and journalist Ray Hanania hosts the Ray Hanania Radio Show, presented by the U.S. Arab Radio Network on WNZK AM 690 Radio and brought to you by Arab News Newspaper. This season's focus is on the U.S. presidential elections. Will it be Donald Trump, Kamala Harris, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., or Dr. Jill Stein? Veteran political analysts and elected officials will join as guests. Join us every Thursday at 5 p.m. on WNZK AM 690 Radio for the Ray Hanania Radio Show, presented by the U.S. Arab Radio Network, a special on the presidential elections. Shows are rebroadcast each Monday at 5 p.m. Get to know more about the show at ArabNews.com. And now I'm here with Dr. Ahmed Ghanem, a Democrat and former candidate in Oakland County, Michigan, for Congress in the 11th District. Dr. Ghanem was invited by Kamala Harris and her campaign committee to a meeting that was going to be held in Michigan to build support among the Arab American community. Ghanem had run as a Democrat in the past. He was allowed into the meeting. And after passing through security and then sitting down, waiting for others for, and with others for the meeting to start, he was asked to stand up and he was escorted out of the meeting without any explanation. It caused an embarrassment for the Harris campaign, which later apologized. It wasn't a good effort to build support for the Arab community for sure in Michigan, a swing state where candidate Harris is having lots of problem. Dr. Ghanem, thank you so much for joining us here on Arab American Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Now, I summarized it a little bit, and the only thing I could hear from people was that maybe the Harris campaign thought you were Amr Ghalib, who was the mayor of Hamtramck, who endorsed um, Donald Trump. Um, but there, I don't know, did you ever find out what the real reason was? Why would they invite you? You pass security, you're a well-known Democrat. Um, and then have this happen to you. This is just very embarrassing for them, I think. Yes, and definitely there is no mistaken identity issue because uh, the reason for that, this is my city where I ran. So I ran a full campaign there. I had my ads. I had my signs. I was canvassing there. I spoke at the Democratic Party, Royal Oak Democratic Club. So there is no way they don't know me. They know me very well. Because uh, it's not like because I'm famous, but because I was there just two months ago campaigning every single day. So uh, I don't think there is a mistaken identity. And um, so far, the, 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 the campaign reached out. They called me and they, they, they recited the same, sta the same statement. They, they keep saying that we regret, but they don't offer any reason why they kicked me out. And I told them, you know, we have to have accountability. Uh, apologizing without accountability does not make any sense. You have, you know, maybe maybe you're right. Maybe there was a mistake. Maybe I did something wrong. But you have to tell me what happened. And you have to come up with a but, statement and say, we kicked him out because he has done this or this. Because I know I have not, I haven't done anything wrong. I was not even having, wearing a sign or having a kofia or a pen or anything. I was wearing a suit. I was sitting there. Even I was not even engaged in any conversation with anyone around me. I was actually, because I went alone and the two people around me, I didn't know them. So I was just, you know, waiting, you know, passing time by answering emails. So there was no provocation at all. There was nothing that can be taken against me and caused me that, you know. And if, in order for you to take someone and toss them out and kick them out without even a provide an explanation those are your base like this is not going to anyone this is this is your base those are people like right. when i had the rsvp you actually you have to put your first name your last name your uh your phone number your email and even you have to put your date of birth that's how invasive the information they have on you about you 
But uh, all that did not lead to any uh, results or anything from their campaign yet to tell me what's what's going on. And this happened this past uh, Tuesday, was it? Yes. This past week, Tuesday. Yes. Now, I I've been through these uh, security clearances. Um, it kind of, if it wasn't a mix-up with names, which would be terrible, um, it just sounds like maybe they don't take the Arab American community as serious as they should. Maybe that's part of it. They invite you in, and then, I don't know, it just, it, it's really embarrassing. I can't think of another excuse why they'd ask you to leave. You're well-known yeah. in the Democratic organization. It would seem that you'd be one of the people they'd want. You ran for office representing the Democratic Party, and they need the community support. What impact do you think this story and this incident is having on her efforts to strengthen Arab American confidence that she can represent the community the way it needs to be represented? I think the effect is zero, not because it doesn't cause any effect, but I don't see any real effort to reach to the Arab and American, Arab American and Muslim American community. The effort, this should be like the time when you meet with everyone and you tell everyone, what do you want? How can we work this out? Maybe you have an idea to talk to your community. You know, we have the good intention. We know we want to save democracy in this country. How can we help each other? But there is no, even, even the conversation is not there. Even just your mere presence as a human being is not <laughs> is not respected. So how would you expect there is any efforts? I think it's 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 I think it's very damaging to the to the people that not even involved or following the you know the news to see that because at the beginning a lot of people were defending. Yeah, maybe he did something wrong. Maybe he said something wrong. Right. Then after that, after we released the video that I I, I filmed, and after they gave up with the statement. There is nothing wrong from our side. So what, why, why it's hard to say, hey, we've done a mistake. Some and some, you know, staff have done a mistake. This is we, we want, we want to be transparent with everyone. We, we apologize for that. But even that, you know, they are not taking this step. And there is two, I think there is two options. We don't have a third option here. Either A, option A, they did not investigate at all which means they don't really take it seriously. It's happened. Let's go. Or option B, they did investigate and they are hiding something. So you either did not investigate or you investigated and hiding yeah. something. And both are, are very bad options. I don't see a, I don't see a third option here. It, it doesn't reinforce community uh, confidence that no. The Kamala Harris campaign is taking the Arab American community seriously. Now, the Arab News uh, newspaper, which sponsors the show and where I write, um, did a poll with YouGov, which suggests that the Arab community with just the Democrats and Republicans are split 50-50 in Michigan and in many other states, many of these swing states. But when you inject the third-party candidate, uh, Jill Stein, she's getting a huge number of votes. Have you seen how the Middle East has impacted the election in Michigan? Has it? How would you interpret what's happening with Arab American voters in the Michigan, in Michigan, which is a critical swing state for both candidates? It definitely impacting the 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 Arab American community and the Muslim American community at large. It's uh, for them they. They see themselves uh, uh, between two choices that they don't really agree with any choice. Even when they go to Jill Stein as uh, a third choice, they know there is probably she's not going to win. And right. Oates is going for a long term uh, effort to build a third, a third party in the United States. And so it's, it's really confusing, especially for a lot of newcomers to politics, which is a lot of big portion of the community were awakened uh, during Gaza and they started to be engaged in politics and now they are facing one of the most critical elections without having a clear choice on what how, how they do and even the people that were saying okay we'll go with Harris because at least at least there will be no racism against us they see an incident like that and said what to what what what's what why then you know there is nothing right there. and at the same time Trump is playing the card of like he went to Hamtramck, which is a small city in, in, in right. two times, mingling with the people, spending time there. They even had ate their traditional Yemeni food with them to show them that 
he understands and he wants to respect their culture. So um, even when he said the bad things about the Yemenis, they talked to him and when his next speech, he did not repeat it. So it, it, for them, a lot of people think maybe here is the trend. Maybe he's actually learning. Maybe he wants to, to come closer. And even whatever you do, whatever you talk to people and say, you know, there is a danger to democracy and stuff like that. People see what they see and they feel what they right. feel. Don't feel this. They, they don't feel like they are welcomed in, in, in the Democratic Party. And when people like me come to them and say, hey, we want to vote Democratic. So even you, you were kicked out. Right. Do you want me to be kicked out like you? It, so, it becomes a weapon that they use. Yeah. And just for our listeners, if they don't remember, we did have Amr Gallup, the mayor of Hamtramck, uh, which is a large Chaldean community too, which is traditionally conservative. Um, but he did endorse uh, Trump, I think, a few weeks ago. And uh, it is a small community. But as you point out, Trump has been in these communities several times. Yes. Harris has had staff there. He's come in offering ideas. She's come in saying, we have a problem. How do we get past it? And I don't know if you've noticed that there have been these billboards that have been posted in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and even in Illinois that says uh, Jill Stein uh was uh voting for jill stein caused trump to win um are you going to let her do that again it seems like harris is taking a negative approach exactly to try to get our vote while trump is trying to be positive and i'm not saying either one is better or worse do you see that happening that maybe she's not doing it the right way is she to definitely, approach the community definitely, definitely you are totally right and I talk to people from the Democratic Party and tell them, you know what, if I was advising Harris, I would finish that in one statement. I would just go and say, hey, here's my statement. I'm not part of that. I'm not I'm not Biden. And here is my statement. And I promise you that in my first 100 days, the war in the Middle East will end. Just as simple as that, without going yeah. in, into details about arm, in, arms embargo, without getting into details about politics. So it's not, you know, I think when she says a statement like that, the Arab Americans will like it. The Muslim Americans will like it. The Jewish Americans will like it because nobody wants, even the Jewish Americans, they don't want war. Nobody wants war. Right. So right. If, if she comes up, I don't know. That's why uh, what, what's, what's, what's really uh, uh, is very interesting to me how she is surrounding by people like very smart people, and they don't come to a, a small conclusion. Yeah, like yeah, I I agree with you. It doesn't sound like they have a good strategy, and it seems that they get angry when they hear that some Arabs are not happy with her, um, that they're going to support Stein. When you hear that voters are not happy with you, you find out why they're not happy, exactly. and then you try to address that that issue. But has she done that at all? No. This is the strategy of the Democratic Party is vote for us or deal with Trump. And wow. using the, the fear the fear tactics. And this is not gonna work anymore. And it works, maybe it works in certain times when there is no not a genocide happening because people say, What is worse than genocide? What right. is worse than right. our families are murdered in Palestine and Gaza? What's worse right. than seeing children dying live on our phones? It's just like, you know, it, it's as you, as, you, as you said, if she came and ha created this positive in engagement with the community, but it's not. It is not. Yeah. And then a final uh, comment. This ha uh, question, has this, uh, I, I assume this doesn't impact your uh, position as a Democrat, because there are a lot of levels of uh, elections for Democrats, local, municipal, county, statewide, congressional, and national. Um, this has this changed your attitude about being a Democrat, and do you think it's things like this, the Harris? Uh, I think failure to deal with the Arab American community has that changed the Arab American community's uh, approach and support of the Democratic Party as a whole, as they have been over the and years. Definitely, it definitely, it definitely affects the community as a whole because since I was, you know, I was active in politics for twenty years, and for us, was politics means working in the Democratic Party. Working with the yeah. Republican Party was unheard of, you know. Right. And but now, uh, are, are the new generations of Arabs and Muslims are asking, why are we bound to the Democratic Party while they don't respect us? So there right. is a shift happening, and the shift happening because the policy is not reacting 
to the ground, to what's happening on the ground, to the change in the ground. We're dealing like we are in the 80s and 90s, and we're not. We are in 2024, and people are different, communities are different, and the needs of the new generation is totally different. All right. Dr. Ghanem, any other uh, issues you want to mention maybe that I didn't ask about? No, any, thank you uh, so much. You're, you're, a, you're, a, you're an amazing, uh, uh, you know, uh, your question was amazing, and thank you so much. That thank was you. really, really good. All right, Dr. Janum, thank you so much. Thank you. thank you so much. Have a good day. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll come back with more here at the Ray Hanania Radio Show. We'll be right back right after these messages. ArabNews.com, bringing you breaking news from across the Middle East and the latest on Arabs in America. Get inside the latest headlines with expert analysis and insights at ArabNews.com. Join over 5 million Facebook fans and over 10 million monthly readers. ArabNews.com, news that matters to you. Are you going to start a restaurant or grocery store soon? Do you need floor plans and designs? Call Naji Aboud at 734-744-9796. Do you want to buy kitchen and restaurant equipment at discount prices? Call Naji Aboud now, 734-744-9796. New concept products and design, the trademark of kitchen equipment. 5% discount on all purchases of $75,000 or more. New concept products and design, new location, 31185 Schoolcraft in Livonia. Learn more at www.newconceptproducts.com. Call Naji Aboud, 734-744-9796. Get ready for an amazing experience at Ishtar Restaurant on 15 Mile Road in Sterling Heights. Enjoy excellent hospitality from owners Ali al-Baghdadi and Fatty Bottom serving the best in Mediterranean food. Try Chef Ali al-Baghdadi's famous shawarma, the best Iraqi grills and food, and the best Arabic and international dishes. Dine in our authentic atmosphere or take out. Call 586-698-2585 or check us out on Facebook. Ishtar Restaurant practices all CDC guidelines and is open every day 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Have an amazing experience today at Ishtar Restaurant, 3625 15 Mile Road, Sterling Heights. Arab news columnist and writer Ray Hanania will host a special focus on the U.S. presidential elections every week on the Ray Hanania Radio Show. Presented by the U.S. Arab Radio Network on WNZK AM 690 Radio in Michigan and brought to you by Arab News Newspaper. Every Thursday from 5 till 6 p.m. on WNZK AM 690 AM Radio, Experts, from elected officials to political analysts, will analyze the presidential election campaign, as well as the results and aftermath, assessing policies that will impact Arabs and Muslims in America and the Middle East. Join us every Thursday at 5 p.m. on WNZK AM 690 Radio for the Ray Hanania Radio Show, special on the presidential elections. Get to know more about the show at ArabNews.com. Thank you for listening to the Ray Hanania Radio Show brought to you by the U.S. Arab Radio Network and sponsored by Arab News, the leading English language newspaper in the Middle East at ArabNews.com. This season, the Ray Hanania Radio Show focuses on the U.S. presidential elections, the battle between the major party candidates, former President Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris, and the third-party contenders who could push the election into the House, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Dr. Jill Stein. We'll be back next Thursday with more special guests to help us understand the role Arab and Muslim voters in America are playing in the presidential election. Check out our page at arabnews.com slash ray radio show for all of the programs that we've recorded and all of the story links that have been written about the program and also you can go to my website at hananiah.com h-a-n-a-n-i-a hananiah.com for my columns my radio shows, my podcasts, and all my writing at Arab News. Have a great week, everybody. See you next Thursday. Good evening.